prophet. It's a very, very profound verse. It's not very simple. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, Alladina yastabiyun al khaw When you listen to the recitation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, take the best meaning from it. Now what does this little part mean? What it means is that there are many meanings possible. Number one, that there are many meanings possible to the word of God. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also concealing that some interpretations are more beautiful than other interpretations. And therefore, He's commanding us to extract the most beautiful meaning of the words of God. What can be the most beautiful meaning of God? That which leads you to kill other human beings? That which leads you to terrorize people? That which leads you to kill children? That which makes you demons in the eyes of the world? Or that which leads you to be compassionate towards others? That which makes you love others so that they may love you in the name of God? That is important. Ask yourself, how can I understand this meaning in the most beautiful way. That is what Ihsan is. That is the highest goal in our faith, to reach a state of Ihsan, where you can understand the most beautiful meanings in the verses of the Quran that are revealed to us. Holy Khawdi Hazar was Alhamdulillah, salatu wa salam ala rasulullah. Awzu billahi min ash-shaytani wajim, bismillahi r-rahmani r-rahim. Inna allaha wa allaika tahu yusalluna ala nabi, ya ayuhal lazina amun sallu alayhi sallim wa taslima. I was last week in a conference called the World Conference of Islamic Thought in Malaysia, where I had an interesting conversation with a sheikh who teaches sharia at one of the universities in Malaysia. While I was sitting with him and having a cup of tea, I got texts text from Brother Naveed asking me if you have prepared the program for tonight. And so I started texting him back and the Sheikh asked to know, what are you doing? I said, I am preparing to celebrate al Maulid on December 1st in Delaware. And he said, he said, what's, what's wrong with that? And so he gave me the, what I call the first degree. Besides the Quran from Surah al maidah saying, Akmal to Deen is Gamor, we have completed your Deen today, and if you, and chosen Islam for you, if you choose anything else, then you are among the losers. So that's paraphrasing the meaning of the verse. And then he proceeds to tell me, also besides, you know, Kullu Rida Dalala, Kullu Dalala, Kullu I said, okay. I said, I'm very slow, and, uh, you know, I come from the country, Look at our president. So you can understand the whole country must be very slow. So please, why don't you enlighten me and explain to me what you mean by Veda? And he says, anything that the Prophet Muhammad did not do, that is Veda. I said, such as living in Malaysia or living in America, is that Veda? And he took a step back because he thought I would have accepted that argument. So he said, no. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has completed the deen, there's nobody else who can add anything to it. I said, the deen is all encompassing. So what is it that we are adding and what is it that we are not? Can you give me a better definition? So he says, okay, it's not about flying cars or, or taking rockets, which none of the things of the Prophet did. He said, in the matters of ibadah, in the matters of ibadah, if you do anything that the Prophet does not do or did not do, then it is better. I said, like 20 rakat tarawih, that we pray systematically in an organized manner, institutionalized, is that what you mean by bidah? And even Harvard Umar recognizes the bidah and calls it a bidah hasana. So now he took another step back. Suddenly he realized that there are some Muslims who think critically. So he thought for a little while and then he redefined it. He said, the definition of bidah is that whatever the Prophet did, and the Sahaba did. If 
If you do anything that they have not done, then it is a beta. Which is very interesting because the entire tradition of Prophet Rashidin will also become a beta because the Prophet did not, did not nominate any successor, but Abu Bakr did right away. So by his earlier definition, that would be bidah. So now he covers himself by saying this. I think so reading Bukhari would be bidah. Saying I'm Shafi, all Malaysian Muslims intend to be Shafi. To say I'm Shafi would then be a bidah. And you know what? Giving food in English would then be a bidah. Which Sahaba gave food in English. So the point really is that they backed off. So he started quoting fatwas from Saudi scholars, Husaymin and Bin Ba'ad, etc. The Wahhabi scholars were very big on this issue. I said, these scholars, they didn't see the fact that monarchy is a bidah. These are the same scholars who have justified monarchy and defended it for the entire age of this current regime. The Prophet was not king, he called himself Malik. And neither did any of the Sahaba or Kulfai Rashidin. So this must be a bidah by your definition. So the only country on earth that has spent billions of dollars fighting bidah is an institution of bidah. <coughs> None of these people who will tell you, oh, have the bidah, yeah, I think, will then turn around and say the royal monarchy in Saudi Arabia is a big bidah. So all their laws and everything becomes illegitimate from their own legal perspective. The Prophet used to fast every Monday. And when he was asked, why do you do that? He said, because I was born on a Monday and I commemorate my birth by fasting. He celebrated his birthday, not by cutting a cake, but by fasting. And that's why many of us fast on his birthday. Because he did that. In fact, he went so much forward. He meant not birth date, but birth day, which comes once every seven times. Every week, they fasted on that. He recognized the importance of his entry into this world. But there are two hadiths I want to share. We should, for those of you who are genuinely focused towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that should be enough. One is this from Anas ibn Mali radi Allah. This is this is what he says. The Prophet, a man came to the Prophet and he said, he was standing with the Prophet and another man was passing by. So the first man looks at the Prophet and says, I love this man. And so the Prophet looks at him and said, Have you told him? Have you told him that you love him? He said, No, I have not. So the Prophet says, Go after him and go and tell him that you love him. So this man runs after him and stops and says, I love you for the sake of Allah. Have you heard this phrase? I love you for the sake of Allah. This is where it comes from, this hadith. So this man stops the other man and says, I love you for the sake of Allah. And that man turns around, what a beautiful man. He says, may the one for whose sake you love me, love you too. May the one for whose sake you love me, you should love him too. The Prophet said another beautiful story. If you love your brother, tell him that you love him. Abu Huraira reports, that a man set out to visit his brother from another town after hearing this. He decided to go to another town to tell that person that he loved that person for the sake of God. So according to this hadith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent an angel to protect him as he traveled to tell another person that he loved him. The angel came to him and said, where are you going? The man said, I'm visiting a brother of mine in this town. The angel said, do you have a favor over him to be repaid? He said, no. Only that I love him for the sake of Allah, and I'm here to tell him that I love him for the sake of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ said that the angel told this man, I'm a messenger from God to tell you that God loves you because you love that person. The essence of these traditions are this. If you love somebody, tell them that you love them. And I love my Rasulullah, and I want to let him know that I love him, and that's why tonight, at 7 o'clock, a lot of young children, a lot of scholars, a lot of students will be here to tell you the stories from the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You will hear young children reciting a hadith. You will hear older students telling, them, telling you why the Prophet is an inspiration in their lives. 
And then we will have all your adults also telling you why it is important for us to know about the life of Prophet Muhammad in this age. In this age of Islamophobia and demonization, mis misrepresentation of Islam and the life of Prophet Muhammad, every opportunity that you get to learn about your religion, enjoy it, exploit it, take maximum benefit from it. I have three announcements to make. One, that today at 7 o'clock we have the celebration of Maudi. Please be here, there will be food here. And I hope there will be also sweets. A lot of baklava if you like. The second announcement that I have to make is that on December 9th, Saturday next, not tomorrow, but the Saturday next, this Masjid is having a fundraiser. We have a lot of expansion to do. Please come and give generously. And even if you don't want to give generously, please come. Enjoy the company, the fellowship, uh, and enjoy the good food and the good conversation that will be available in this masjid. And then if your heart becomes soft, make your wallet a little lighter. The connection between a soft heart and a light wallet. The third announcement that I have to make is that there are some young students here from the University of Delaware who are raising money for the Rohingya refugees in Burma. And me and Mark, or oh, those who are in Bangladesh, and they have promised me that 100% of the funds that are raised here are going directly to the refugees. So those people from the community who are flying to Bangladesh to provide this aid from here, from Dover actually, the Imam of Masjid Dover is organizing this fundraiser, they will pay for that flight themselves. So every cent that you give is going directly to the refugees in Bangladesh. Uh, we also have with us some of my students who are studying Islam in world affairs at the PhD level, and they are welcome here. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that on this blessed day of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa birthday, we understand what it means that he was sent as Rahmah to all of humanity. And it, I hope that it inspires us to also become, in little ways, Rahmah to the environment that we live in in your workplace, in your community, among your friends, among your colleagues, become a source of compassion and love. Rabban atayna fi dunya hafalatum wa fila akhirati wa hafalatum wa fila azadanna inna allaha ya'amuru bil adli wal ihsan wa intaji al-qurba wa yanhar al-tashay al-munka wa al-babi yu'izakum la'allakum tazakkaroon wa qimu al-salah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أي رسول أي رسول الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة لما كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر لما كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر وذكر الله كثيرا ولما رأى المؤمنون الأحزاب قالوا هذا ما وعدنا الله ورسوله قالوا هذا ما وعدنا الله ورسوله وصدق الله ورسوله وما زادهم إلا إيمانا 
إيمانا وتسليما من المؤمنين